The Lord Jesus Christ is our guarantee of God's everlasting and eternal love for us. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of God's commitment to finish the good work that God has begun in us. So welcome to the Regeneration Project's live service. The Regeneration Project is a community of friends who are living, learning, and loving the way of Jesus. We seek continuously to be an ever-inclusive community, challenging all forms of oppression, not by preaching or teaching alone, but by living in action and demonstrating what it means to offer radical hospitality. So it's great to be with you on this, the last Sunday of the first month of this 2022. I'd like to share with you um, some reflection from uh, the Pauline writing of Ephesians chapter 2 and reading the message paraphrase. It reads, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old life, that stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with a polluted unbelief and exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us, doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It isn't any wonder that God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy, with an incredible love, God embraced us. God took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ. God did all of this on God's own with no help from us. God picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where God wants us, with all the time in the world, and the next to shower grace, kindness upon us, 
in Christ Jesus. Saving is all God's idea and all God's work. All we do is trust God enough to let God do it. Yeah. It's God's gift from start to finish. You know, especially when you're trying to live a deeper life, a more meaningful life, a more significant life, you can get frustrated with the fits and stops. You know, one step back, two steps, one step forward rather, two step back, back, and the, the backsliding that is inevitable. I will lift up my hand, my right hand to heaven and say, I am a backslider. Um, you know, in many, many different ways, you start off with good intentions in the morning at prayer time, and by lunchtime, you've backslid into old habits or old thought patterns and you have to catch yourself or rather be caught by the grace of God. But I love that verse which says, which says, um, now God has us where God wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all God's idea and all God's work. All we do is trust God enough to let God do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. Amen. I want you just to, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whether you're here at St. Mark's or at home, sit back in faith, which is hard work, because many of us are doers and we like to do stuff. But sit back in faith and trust God to, to let God do what God and God alone can do in your heart, your mind. And then with faith, work with God in the development of spiritual fruit as God produces that energy in you. Um, hallelujah and praise the Lord. We're going to go into a time of prayer. And if you have any prayer requests, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will try to monitor those. We may not get to see them, but we, you are on our minds, on, on our hearts. So if there are any prayer requests, please share them. We're going to pray. Um, so, I'm so we're praying for a good start yeah. of a new term back at university for Ella, and by extension for everyone um, who is going back to university. Um, for a good start for them also. Dean, it's Hi. good to see you. Welcome. It's good to be good to see you too. Yes, uh, can you please pray for my son? Yes. Um, he's gone back to the way he came. Yeah. Uh, you know, not in a good place. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, he's in a place that only God, it's only God can reach his voice. And I'm so glad that God will. So we're going to pray yeah. uh, for Dean's son. Can we just pray for the community of Newton again, uh, or specifically for people who are um, poor in the community that their needs will be met? Yes. So we're praying for Mitchum, the community in which we minister and operate, but more particularly, we're praying for the poor in this community who are near to God's heart. And we're praying also for those of us who are struggling with resources and finances. Um, loving God. Our Father, loving God, our Mother, loving God, who is the carer, the comforter, and the lifter up of our head. You are concerned with everything about us. Every detail of our life is in your reflection and your form. The things that we worry about aren't just incidental. They're not just things that you, you brush away as unimportant. You care. And so in the words that comes from Peter's letter, or the letter entitled Peter, we cast all of our cares on you, knowing that you care for us. We lift up Ella, who is going back to university. We pray for a positive start, that it will be a springboard into bigger and better things. Thank you for the achievement so far. But we pray that she will go back with renewed vigor and energy, bless the relationships and friendships she has there as she returns. And we pray for every returning student that will be going back into halls of residence or going back into fields of study, that you would bless them, that you would strengthen them in this time where danger is all around. Keep them safe from her accident, injury, and harm. Lord, we lift up before you Dean and her son. 
Lord, I thank you that before um, that both of them were a twinkle in their, their parents' eye, you knew them and you love them and you care about them. Lord, you are the God in which past, present and future are literally right before you. And so, God, because you live in the eternal now, now, Lord, go into the past and undo the things that the enemy has done to create problems now in the present. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit, flow backwards with your grace and heal the wounds of the past. Undo the damage of the past. Recover the things that were lost in the past. Bring ministry and minister deliverance now. Lord, we call his name in our heart and in our minds. And we bring that child before you. And then the strong and the mighty name of Jesus, we pray you would draw that child back to yourself with loving kindness and tender mercies and restore what, that which is a fractured relationship. We're praying, God, for uh, Maureen, who is resting after a really busy week. And Martha Sylvester, who is recovering from a time of illness. We're praying, God, for all of the extended family members of this fellowship and this ministry. We call the names of Didi and Priscilla we pray, and Ava. We call their name. We call the name of Rome, Cynthia, uh, and Robin. We call their name. We call the names of Brian, Lord. We call Brian Solomon. We call their names of Tabitha and Theodore. We call their names of Pauline. We call their names. We call their names of Samantha and, and, and Desiree. We call their names in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Wherever they are, whatever they, they are doing, may they feel the radiation of your love. Felix, at work or wherever he is right now, bless him. Thank God for Maria's in the house and, and Julia in the house. We pray for Rivaldo, God, and study at university, actually an internship in the world of work and industry. Pray that you would bless him and, and Maravilla, wherever she is, whatever she's doing, bless them. Bless the whole community. Lord, may we grow in ever-increasing strength and we give you praise and glory through the strong and the mighty name of Jesus, who is the stamp and guarantee of your love for us. We bless you now. We praise you now. Yes. We lift up your name right now. And all those people said, shall we celebrate the amazing grace of God?
21 that's struggling right now. Struggling and you want to be free and you want to be delivered. I want to tell you that he laid down his life. That you might be set free. He laid down his life. That you may be set free. Whatever is holding you back. Whatever is bringing you down. Whatever is separating you from the joy that God has for you. Jesus Christ is the guarantee of God's love and God's goodwill towards you. Jesus laid down his life.
morning everybody. We thank God for his goodness, for his grace and for his mercy. It's good to be here with you all um, this morning. Let us pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that we could be here. And as we spend a few moments just looking through your word and uh, looking through the scripture and trying to hear what the Spirit says to us, I pray you will open up our hearts, you will speak to us, you will challenge us, Lord. I pray that you will make us better, Lord God. You will make our relationships better, Lord God. I pray for flourishing. I pray for growth. I pray for healing. I pray for joy. And all of the good things that come from you in our relationships. We thank you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 How are you all doing this morning? I'm alive. <laughs> Excellent. It's good. And to everybody online, we welcome you this morning and uh, it's good to have you um, with us. Um, we started this journey um, last year talking about relationships. And one of the things that sort of we've, we banged the drum of over the several months that we've been looking at this is this central idea of love. Everyone say love. 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 And how love is the core of everything we do as followers of Jesus. I believe it's, it's our purpose. I believe that we are created um, for, to love. I believe we are called to love. You know, people talk about I'm called to this, that and the other. Our primary calling is being called to love. Um, I believe that love is at the core of everything we do as followers of Jesus, as everything we do as, as, as Christians. What is Christianity about? Ultimately, it is about love. love. It, and it starts with God loving us. It starts with that God who gave up his life for us and reaches down to us and calls us his beloved and invites us into the dance of the Trinity it starts with God and then it reaches out beyond us where we're encouraged to love others, to love God rather, to love others as we love ourselves. Everything we do as followers of Jesus must be about love. And everything else is periphery. Yes. Nothing else really matters. It's about love. And we yearn to love, don't we? That's why most of the stuff we watch on TV is about love or people trying to find love. Or we love love, don't we? We yearn to love. We love a good love story. We yearn to love. And we yearn to be loved. When we face rejection, it's an awful feeling because it strikes us right at the core of where we are. This, this idea of we need or to be loved. So we started out before Christmas when we started on this, this discussion about relationships, talking about love. And as we wind up this series, I want us to go back to that discussion about love. Paul writes to the um, Corinthian church, the church community in, in Corinth. He says to them, you can speak with all of the elegance you want, Tongues of men, he calls them, tongues of angels. You can engage in all kinds of spiritual acrobats and es ecstasy. But without love, it's just a clanging noise. Have you ever heard a kid trying to play an instrument like drums? And they can't really play. <laughs> it's just a clanging noise. Batching noise. And Paul says, if we speak as eloquently as we can, and if we talk with the tongues of angels and engage in all these spiritual activities that we want to do, without love, that's all it is. A clanging, bashing noise. He tells the church of Corinth that they can preach. They can give prophecies. They can explain mysteries. They can even uh, have the kind of faith that does the miraculous and moves mountains. And he says, if you don't have love, guess what? It doesn't matter. It's pointless. Imagine that. You, you, you give your life to the mastery of, of preaching and being a leader and all of that eloquence. And Paul says, if you don't have love, nothing. nothing. It doesn't 
matter. There was no point in you doing it. And then he says that you can give everything you've got away. You can give even your own body in martyrdom. And if it's not done with love, it has no benefit. Tell somebody no profit. No profit. No profit. And then he goes on to say this. He says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all. And at the end of it, he talks about there are three things, faith, uh, faith, hope and love. And the greatest, he says, of these three is love. N.T. Wright, when speaking about 1 Corinthians 13, he says this. He says, the point of 1 Corinthians 13 is that love is not our duty. It is our destiny. It is the language Jesus spoke and we are called to speak it so that we can converse with him. It is the food that they eat in God's new well and we must acquire the taste for it here and now. It is the music God has written for all his creatures to sing and we are called to learn it and practice it now so as to be ready when the conductor brings down his baton. Everybody say love. love. I love that. It's not a duty. It's a destiny. It's the thing that we are called for. What you see in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter um, 13 is, is you see one of the most comprehensive definitions of love in, the, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. One of the most comprehensive definitions you'll find in scripture. Um, on love. And what's interesting, I, I, and I'm sure you've heard this, but have you, have you heard people talk about tough love? Yeah. You, you know, talk about, well, you know, sometimes you've got to have some tough love. <laughs> and, and when you listen, you know, to those definitions of tough love, one of the things I've realised, it's not there. No. There's nothing there about being nasty to people. No. There's nothing there about being rude to people and harsh to people. And, and, you know, sometimes you just got to slap them in the most loving way you can. There's nothing there about that. Okay? Um, and, and, and that's fortunate. Because what Corinthians give us, Corinthians actually gives us what true tough love is. It, it, what you see in, in Corinthians is the kind of tough love that never gives up. The kind of tough love that's not nasty. The kind of tough love that's not resentful. The kind of tough love that doesn't force itself on others but respects other people. The kind of tough love that isn't always me first, me first, me first. The kind of tough love that, that doesn't keep the scores of the sins of others. You know those kind of people that I remember when we were three years old. You know, the kind of people that write things in a black book, you know, and, and keep score. This is tough love. The kind of love that doesn't revel in other people's misfortune. The kind of love that takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. The kind of love that puts up with a lot. The kind of love that believes all things. Always looks for the best. The kind of love that never looks back. And the kind of love that keeps Going to the end. Tell somebody this is tough love. This is tough love. This is tough love. And, and don't get me wrong. Love is tough. Because love sticks around. And love makes the effort. And love it goes through tough times. And deals with some tough stuff. You know love is tough. Because sometimes what people throw back at you isn't nice. But love sticks in there. When it can and holds out. Love is tough because love challenges. And love is tough because it holds us to account. However, love is not nasty. Love is not abusive. And love is, is not horrible behaviours that we mask as love. That's not tough love. What Corinthians uh, 13 tells us, it tells us what is 
possible if we give in to our calling and destiny. It tells us what is possible if we follow our true calling. It tells us what is possible if we allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives every day. It tells us what is possible if we're willing to learn, practice and master the way of Jesus. I want you to say that to somebody. Look at them and say, learn. Look at somebody else and say, practice. And tell somebody else, master. Learn, practice and master. It lets us know what is possible. If we will just let God into our lives and we will just <coughs> learn the way of Jesus. What I want to talk to you about today, I want to talk about a habit of loving or the habit of loving. Now, now, what I'm not telling you today is I'm not telling you that love is a habit. Because love is so much more than that. Love, love, love is love. And love can't just be reduced to a habit. But, but what I'm talking about today is where we make loving habitual. It's where we behave and we conduct ourselves and we act in a way that is loving and we make that habitual. Everyone say habit. The definition of the word habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. A habit is a thing that you do over and over and over again. And you do it so often that you actually do it without thinking. We've all got habits, some good ones and some bad ones. You know, I, re I remember um, when I was growing, when I was younger, one of the habits I had, I, I used to bite my nails incessantly and bite my fingers. And, 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 and it was a habit that was born out of my own insecurity. It was a habit that was born out of when I was uncomfortable and in uncomfortable situations and circumstances. And guess what? It took me a long time to unteach myself that habit. Um, habit is something you do without thinking. It, it, and, 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 you know, when we think of the habits that we do, you, you know, some people, they struggle with things like OCD. Uh, and they struggle with other sort of uh, psychological um, conditions. And all of those things are born out of habits. They're born out of things that we, we do and they become powerful and life controlling sometimes because we develop them as coping mechanisms. You know, when you see someone, they've got to flick the lights ten times or they've got to tap on the wood ten times or they've got to do this or that or something else. It's all of these habits we do because we couldn't cope and we do them as a way of trying to cope and trying to control. And, and we do them so often... That, that, that we can't undo them easily. You know, habits, habits. We all have habits. Brushing your teeth for most of us is a habit. You get up in the morning and most of the time you don't think about it. You, you just get on with it. And, and you know, we, we, we often talk about bad habits, but today I want to talk about good habits. And I want to talk about the habit of loving. I want to talk about the habit of making love habitual. Uh, uh, and, and, and actually, the, the, the habit of loving is actually lots of little habits. It's lots of little things that we do every single day. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about lots of little kind acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about lots of little times and moments of compassion and, and caring. 1 Corinthians 13 is about lots of little moments of peacemaking, of joy giving. Of, 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 of being hopeful. 1 Corinthians 13 is about what happens when we learn to deal with the habits in our life that are not healthy. When we learn to deal with our resentment and our anger and our jealousy. And guess what? They're all things that we have and we will suffer with. And, it, and it's about what we do when we learn to de deal with those in a healthy way. Habits. Everyone say habits. habits. Love must become a series of habits that we engage in every single day. Lots of little habits that we practice over and over and over again in our different relationships until they become our default position. Uh, the author Stephen, Stephen Covey, he says this, he says, So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a uh, destiny. Habits start out as thoughts. They start out as something that's formed in our mind, in our thinking. 
And you know, one of the, the spiritual disciplines that's really pow powerful in helping us develop positive habits is prayer. Because prayer is, in, 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 in one dimension, a, a meditative, reflective thought process. It's where we think about what we're going through. It's where we reflect on what we're going through. It's where we reflect on what we want to become. It's where we reflect on the things that are not quite the way we think they should be and how we want them to work out. And it, it, it's that process that we do. And it's interesting because when Paul writes to the church community in Philippi, his closing remarks say this. He says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatsoever is true... Whatsoever is honourable, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Because habits start with our thoughts. So a thought, what do you read? An action. Because the stuff we think about, start thinking and praying about stuff and the habits you want to see in your life and in your relationships. And, and, and uh, guess what happens? We start changing. We start doing those things. And, and, and today I want you to think about the habits that you, you might need in some of your relationships. And I, I will say this, you know, you know, there are some relationships that they won't change Unless we start thinking about the habits that we need to, we want to see in those relationships. There are some relationships, they won't change unless we start thinking about some of the things that we're doing that are not helping those relationships. So I want us to think about that this morning. For a habit to take form, those thoughts must become an action. And when we talk about actions, so sow a thought, reap an action. When we talk about actions, I'm not talking about big, earth-shattering actions. You know, sometimes when we, when we think about actions, we think about the things that's going to move mountains, don't we? We think about the things that, you know, that's going to cause an impact. No, 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 no. The, the, the kind of actions that, that Stephen Covey talks about, and we're talking about today, are those little, everyday actions. Actions. Tell somebody little everyday actions. Small actions. The ones, the stuff that sometimes people don't notice them. And then after a while they go, do you know what? You've changed. I don't know when, but, but it's little everyday things that we do that, that can go unseen for most people. And, and the thing about we've, when we start new habits, uh, I don't know if any of you have started new habits. Guess what? They're uncomfortable, aren't they? Yeah. You know when you start doing something that's not natural to you, that, that's, that's unusual for you. You know, like if your default position is one of those grrr people, you know what I mean? Like, how are you? Grrr. How was your weekend? Grrr. You know, those people, that, there's an aggression when you, you know, if you start to change that, you know, and someone says, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm doing rather well. It, it can feel unnatural, you, you, you know. Or if you're oh. someone that, that, that's not friendly as you, should, as you could be, you know, you, know, you, know, you decide, I'm going to be a lot more friendly. And I'm going to put some habits in my life to help me to be more friendly. You know, when you start it, it can, it can make you feel fake. It can make you feel phony, you know. Um, and... You know, starting to engage a different way of thinking is uncomfortable, but it, a habit is something that you've got to keep on practicing. How many of you drivers, okay, remember learning how to drive? It was the most unnatural thing. I remember the most unnatural thing was getting my feet to do different things. I learned in a manual car. Just getting my feet to do different things. My feet now. They've got a mind of their own. They, yeah, they do it all by themselves. I don't even think. I don't even think. Quick, slam the brake. My foot just breaks. Lisa says, way too slowly, but there you go. <laughs> um, you, you know, and, and that is the thing about habits. The more we practice them, the more we do them, they become embedded in our life. And, 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 and when we talk about this idea of embedding habits into our life and embedding actions into our life. Tell somebody it's deliberate. It's a deliberate process. You know, one of the interesting things you see in the New Testament 
is the New Testament um, writers, they tell the various communities a lot of the time to put on certain things, to put off certain things, and to put away certain things. Just a few examples. Romans 13 verse 14, put on Jesus. Colossians 3 verse 10, Ephesians 4 verse 10, put on the new self. Um, Romans chapter 12 verse 13, put on the armour of life. Ephesians 6, put on the whole armour of God. You see, over and over again, this idea of putting on, putting on, putting on, and, and putting off, and putting away. And, 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 and the word here for, for, for putting on, it's, a, it's an action word. And it literally means to do something. It's a doing word. And what it means, it means to, it, the word put on, it literally means to invest in yourself. It is the idea of doing something deliberately and conscious, uh, consciously and investing in yourself. Stephen Covey says, sow an action, reap a habit. And you see, the more we sow actions, the more we do these things that then become, ultimately they become habits and they become part of our character, they become part of our lifestyle. And this morning, I just want you to think about your relationships. I want you to think about some of the relationships where you might need to start doing something different in those relationships. You know, if you're not happy with what you're seeing in certain relationships, you know, it's a good sign that both of you need to start doing something different. Okay, it's a, it's a good sign, trust me. It is a good sign that things as they're going here are not working the way that they should be. And we both need to start doing something different. Now I want to say this. You only have power over you. Yes. Yeah. You don't have power over everybody else. And sometimes we, we focus a lot on everybody else. Well if they did this. Then I would do that. If they didn't. And, and the truth of the matter is. As much as you want to try and change somebody else's behaviour. You can't. The only thing that you can change. Is you. And so when we talk about this idea of, of, of the habit of loving, the idea is that actually we forget what other people are doing to a certain degree and focus on what we can do to make things different, to make things better. I want to, um, I just want to um, finish, I, I'm, I'm done really this morning, but I just want to finish um, on, on this idea of eight habits of love. I just want to give you eight habits um, of, of, of love. Um, now, this is not something I've come up with, so if you think it's good, and um, you know, say that was a really good film, I'm happily take the, the, um, you know, compliments. the compliments. But unfortunately, it's not something that I come up with. I've borrowed it. Um, I've borrowed it from a few people. Um, they're, they're all, there's a few people that have written on this, but one of the more prominent writings on this is a priest I have not come across before, but someone called Ed Bacon. And interestingly enough, he's an advocate for justice on issues of race, gender, faith, sexual orientation, sexuality, and all of those things. He's, he's one of these priests, that have, he's appeared on Oprah, and this is what has made his, his book quite, um, quite um, popular, I think. But he says this in his book, he says, I want to invite you on an adventure. It's a lifelong journey that will take you to the deepest, most sacred place within yourself. That powerful inner sanctuary resides in each of us, every human being on earth. And when we access this sanctuary, it grounds us in love, giving us courage and resilience to stand up to fear. When we open our hearts and minds to love's abundance, we can transform not only our own lives, but also the lives of those around us, making the world a more just, peaceful and caring place. He says, it's taken me a lifetime to understand that learning to embrace love and practice its habits at every turn are the deepest responsibilities we have as humans. And I invite you to take a place by my side on this long and eventful journey so we may travel together along with many others towards a better life and a better world. And he gives us in his book eight Habits of love. These are the eight habits. Generosity, stillness, truth, candor, play, forgiveness, compassion, and community. And I just want to run these as I, as I close up this morning. The first habit he gives us is the habit of generosity. And the habit of generosity 
opens up our hearts so that we may give and we may receive. With the habit of generosity, we can live in a spirit of abundance. Since all that we have, we give away to others and it comes back to us in a different form. Each act of selfless kindness gives us the boost of letting go of our fear of um, scarcity. He said, Ed Bacon says, overcoming fear to live daily with the spiritual practice of an open and generous heart. He says, this means knowing that love flows through you generously to others. This includes not only giving money to less fortunate um, people, but your time, your emotional and spiritual support, your encouragement. And uh, you can make a practice of living, lifting rather others up. Giving time and attention to others only enhances our own lives. The habit of generosity, not scarcity, not worrying about, oh my God, what if it runs out? But giving and allowing it to flow through you. God's love to flow through you. God's resources and peace to flow through you. Allowing it to flow. And, and, and when it flows, it's that thing. It, it always comes back to us. The second habit he deals with is the habit of stillness. Everyone say stillness. stillness. The stillness habit restores a calm confidence. With the habit of stillness, we listen to the beloved. And we slow down the fast pace of our lives. Entering this sacred space on a daily basis is good training in surrendering to the Holy One. Who is the source of all silence and peace. He says, learn to quiet your body, your mind. This quiet space within us is where we plan, get inspiration, strategize, dream, self-nurture. There are many roads to this inner stillness. Look for yours and, and find it. You know, and I don't know what you do to still, to, to, to get that stillness. We're all slightly different, aren't we? You know, I like going for a walk. And actually, one of the things I do like doing is walking by myself. Because when I walk by myself, I can drown out everything else. Yes, sir. And I can hear myself. I can hear what I believe is God. I can hear that small uh, still voice. It's in the habit of stillness where we hear God say, you are the beloved. You are my child. I love you. You are precious. It's in that place of stillness where we replenish all of the stuff that's been depleted in our lives so that we can go back and face the issues and the circumstances that we need to face. It's in, it's in that habit of stillness when we get those things that we haven't spoken out to other people off our chest. Yes, sir. And we start to work those issues out and figure out how we're going to deal with those. The third habit he gives us is the habit of truth. The habit of truth causes us to challenge our assumptions about ourselves and others and leads us to growth. What he says, this involves developing the courage to go against what is expected of you by others at times. Mm -hmm. It means choosing tr truth rather than self-deception or deception of others um, and, it, and making it a daily practice. He says, telling the truth is both frightening and refreshing. He says, truth leads us to a more honest and vital life. Have you ever told yourself the truth? Have you ever been in that place where you're, you're, you're perpetuating something? You're, you're just sort of like, yeah, well, this is, this is, this. And, 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 you know, some people might say it's God, but sometimes it's yourself going, stop that. You're right, that's a lie. Yeah, I found myself in that place of prayer, saying stuff, but God, this, that. And I've gone, feel you're lying to yourself. And now you're trying to lie to God. And he ain't fooled. And neither is your real self. And is that thing about, and, and truth starts with us actually speaking it to ourselves. Um, and then we can speak it to other people in loving ways. Tell somebody in loving ways. <laughs> you know, when people are just telling the truth. No, 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 we've got to learn to tell the truth in loving ways. The next habit that he gives is the habit of candor. He says, practicing the habit of candor 
deepens relationship. With the habit of candor, we are challenged to speak truth from the heart and train ourselves further in the art of listening. He says, this is the riskiest uh, of habits since we can misread a personal situation. So care must be taken to lay the groundwork carefully. Using both tenderness and tact, candor helps us to have a difficult, important conversations with those we care about. We don't avoid in fear. We move towards the other person in love and candor. The, ha- the, the habit of candor is the hardest of habits to practice because it involves risk. It involves saying, this is how I feel. Yeah. Or this is how things look. Yeah. Or this is what I did. It, it, it's that honesty. And, and, and candor is, see, sometimes people see candor as a power grab. You know, candor is not a power grab. Um, you know, but people that are, that are involved in therapy, one of the things that they will see is the healing, um, transcendent power of honesty. There is something about when you have that honest conversation, that difficult but honest conversation. You can ruminate over in your head for days, for days, for days. And then you have that conversation. And sometimes it, it's not easy. But even when it is the most horriblest of conversations, there is something, there's a peace that comes after you've had that conversation. Um, and, you know, when we're candid with each other, when we do, when we explore that with each other in our relationships, then our relationships become more transparent, they become more open, and the moment they become more open, the more they can grow. The next habit he gives us is the habit of play. He says the habit of play changes our brain chemistry. I love this. It frees us up to access our imagination. It becomes the most creative, constructive, joyful individual we can be. With the habit of play, we celebrate humanity and the the creativity within us that is yearning for expression. This habit takes within within its embrace laughter, a liberating force that comes with the lightness of being. I love this habit. I'm good at this habit, by the way. And sometimes people are like, you're you're how old and you're doing what? I'm playing. I'm engaging in the habit of play. Um, Play and laughter change our brain chemistry. Play activates our imagination and creativity. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, like, one of, one of the things I loved, as, and I still love it as Marley's growing up, but, but playing with him. There is something about when you play with young children, isn't there? There is something about, you know, toddlers, even younger, there is something about just that little silly game you play with kids that does something to us. Play and lightness Renew us. Do you know what often in life we're, we're, we're way too serious? Yes, sir. We're way... I remember years ago, right, me and Lisa were out on the town. And um, we were up London. We were coming back by the train. And we, we, we had a good time. We'd had a little drink. And we, we, we were happy. And we were on the train. And guess what? We're silly as well. And we were being silly. And, and there was this person opposite us. He, he'd obviously been out on the town. Um, but he had a hiccup. Right? And it was, it was the funniest hiccup you'd ever heard in your life, right? And, and this guy was like, um, he had this hiccup. He, I go, it was this kind of hiccup, right? Just, and, and me and Lisa there, now we're, we're silly already. Yeah. We've, got, we've got the spirit that's helping us be silly, right? <laughs> going in our blood, right? So we don't need no encouragement. And we're there. And we start nudging each other, right? And we're doing our best not to laugh. Because we don't want this guy to feel bad, right? We, you know, we're doing our best not to laugh. But and the thing is, the more we're trying not to, is the more we're looking like, and, and, and people on the train started laughing. <laughs> and, and, and I felt sorry for this guy, because he was uncontrollable. And I, I do repent of my bad behaviour if I see this. But this guy was so serious. <laughs> And the best thing he could have done laugh. was join in there and laugh with us. And sometimes we spend our life being so serious and not laughing.
laughing at ourselves, embarrassed by something. You know when you're embarrassed by it, do you know what the best thing to do is laugh about it. it it's the best way to deal with it. When someone says, ah, oh, look at you, go, yeah, it's funny, weren't it? And laugh at yourself. And you know, a lot of the times we don't laugh at ourselves. And I think that's one of the things that we, we need to engage in. The next habit is the habit of forgiveness. And this is where we move beyond the blame game and the prison of fear and self-punishment and revenge. This is where the healing power of forgiveness that brings hope to painful relationships. Um, Ed Bacon says, when you can, forgiving somebody who has wronged you releases a powerful, loving energy. When we hold on to wrongs, we hold tension, anger, resentment and hurt. You don't have to reconnect with the person that, you, that hurt you in order to forgive. Forgiveness brings self-healing, self-empowerment. And, and you know, one of, I think one of the most powerful examples of forgiveness that we have in our history is what happened in South Africa mm. after apartheid and the work that Nelson Mandela, Bishop Desmond Tutu um, and, and others that were a part of what they were doing there did with the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And they took the power away from revenge. And forgiveness became something healing yes, sir. that reached through, through that nation. The last two, the habit of compassion. Practicing the habit of compassion is not only good for others, but it, it can help us find more meaning, more connection, more love within ourselves. Compassion is a must for our relationship. Yes. Guess what? When you offer somebody compassion, guess what? You're opening the door for compassion to come back for you. Mm -hmm. And guess what? At some point, we all need compassion. Yeah. We all need it. You know, compassion is one of those things that I think we ought to give it in bucket loads. Yeah. You know, get the biggest container you can muster of yourself yeah, and yeah. fill it up and pour it out. Because when I need it, I want something to dive in. I don't want you ringing a little flannel of compassion over me. I want a big bath that I can dive in when I need compassion. And that's what happens when we practice compassion in our relationship with each other. The challenge here is trying to stretch the edges of your compassion to all living beings. And it is a challenge. And it's, it's learning not to dehumanise people. Even when people do the worst. It's about not dehumanising those people. And the last one that I'm finishing up on is the habit of community. Very opening book of the Bible says it's what? Not good for us to be alone. We are made for community. We thrive on community. One of the most damaging things I think that's happened over the last few years throughout this pandemic yeah, yeah. is the way community shut, got shut down in some respects. And we were creative, weren't we? We found new ways to share community and be community even though we were locked up. But community is something we need. We need each other. Anybody tells you that I don't need anybody else is lying to themselves and lying to everybody around you. Connecting with people whose lives we intersect, we intersect with us is practicing building community. And, 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 and the thing about community is we're all different. And sometimes we agree. And sometimes we disagree. You know, even the most closest person to you. You know, me and Lisa don't agree on everything, you know. We disagree. But guess what? When we disagree, how we need to disagree? We need to disagree in love. And that's what community teaches. I'm scared that this movement that says, you're different, so out you go. Yeah. Yeah. You're different. I can't. You vote different. You yeah, think yeah, yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. You have different beliefs. And no matter how wacky I think yeah. those beliefs are, yeah. you know, um, actually, even if you have wacky beliefs, or what I consider wacky beliefs, you know, it's actually how do we still engage with and learn to live with? How do we deal with the beliefs, your beliefs that are hurtful to me or my beliefs that are hurtful to you? How do we deal with those? And it's only in community that we learn that respect with each other and we learn to live with each other. Anyway, I'm done for this, uh, this afternoon. Um, that was 
the habit of loving. And hopefully, um, if, if I didn't bless you, the work of Ed Bacon did. So God bless you. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. <laughs>